Enchanted Sky Media. 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 This is Code 3, the podcast for firefighters. Now, here's your host, Scott Orr. Thank you for joining me on this, the premiere episode of Code 3, the podcast for firefighters. I hope you'll enjoy listening to members of the fire service talk about their concerns, what their jobs are like, and how they do things at their departments. My guest today is Dennis Light. He's the chief of the Prescott, Arizona Fire Department. Chief Light took over at a very turbulent time. It was less than a year since Presky lost 19 city firefighters who were members of the Granite Mountain Interagency Hotshot Crew. They were the only city-based hotshots in the U.S. Then the previous chief was either forced out or resigned, depending on who you ask. Things have calmed down since Chief Light came from Yuma, Arizona about three years ago. So we'll start this first edition of Code 3 with Dennis Light. Well, good morning, Scott. I'm looking forward to this opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you. Thank you, sir. So let's get right into it. What was it like to join a department that was in turmoil? Well, it's uh, needless to say, it's, uh, I was up for the challenge, I think, uh, You know, not that uh, Yuma didn't present its own challenges, but uh, we were running a a pretty good sailing ship at the time, so uh, I think it was the right time in my uh, professional development to uh, look for new things and uh, to come in in the aftermath. It was uh, uh, rather enlightening, to say the least, when you get on board and uh, a week or two after you're on the job, you're asked to present uh, before 5,000 members of the community down on the courthouse square. Uh, kind of a remembrance project for the Granite Mountain Hotshots. How was morale in the department at that time? You know, it's it, morale's a very hard thing to truly measure. Uh, you know, you kind of know in your gut when it's good. You kind of know in your gut when it's not so good. And, uh, you know, as I uh, kind of offered my, uh, as I say, environmental scanning to, before I took the position, you know, I kind of understood uh, some of the challenges that the men and women of the Prescott Fire Department had faced, and I felt that I had some skill sets that I could bring forward. And, you know, I think uh, coming into the organization in the aftermath of that, you can't get much lower to the ground than after any department loses a member. So the uh, the positive out of that is I only had really one way to go, and that was kind of going up. And uh, I think we've uh, accomplished some good things along the way for the last couple of years. What was the public sentiment like? You know, the public sentiment... Uh, in the aftermath of disasters, uh, you know, right out the gate, uh, people, you know, really adore their firefighters and law enforcement officers and our U.S. Armed Forces. Um, you know, but that does have a tendency to wane after after time has passed. Uh, with that, though, the, you know, the Prescott community is very close-knit. Uh, you know, there's very few places I can go, and it's not just by name and facial recognition, but uh, very few places I can go in this community without running into a, a friend, a colleague, an associate, or somebody that uh, knows of us. So it was, it, it's held on here very well for much of the community sentiment. But the community support was uh, very well received, not only by the men and women of the, of the Prescott Fire Department, but by the community in general, I think, uh, uh, held its own uh, through the aftermath of the uh, Yarnell Hill fire. I know the city's officials at first said the hotshot crew would be rebuilt, but that never happened. Why not? You know, I think there's some uh, economic realities uh, in the aftermath of disaster that uh, cities and, and even huge uh, conglomerations start to understand a better picture. Uh, you know, there was a... Uh, uh, risk being borne by the city uh, that was probably uh, not sustainable as they move forward and as uh, different things took hold and we looked at, uh, you know, the mission of uh, our community risk reduction, we kind of got out of the fire suppression piece of the hot shots, but we still have an emphasis on the community risk reduction piece, which is uh, 
specifically to fuels reduction and uh, kind of be able to create defensible space in our community. Did those 19 firefighters work in the structural division? No, they were in a separate division. We had a wildland division at the time. Uh, the 19 uh, plus uh, the sole survivor, uh, they basically worked under a division chief in our wildfire uh, division, which during uh, fire season, which traditionally for our local area runs from April till uh, usually about July 4th, uh, they would remain available primarily in this local area for response. And in their off hours, we do mitigation work. Uh, the problem became was, uh, you know, during the uh, off season of our local fire uh, season here locally, uh, they were part of a national system, actually a statewide system that uh, makes itself available to national uh, needs as well. And it was not unfounded for them to be uh, responding away from the Prescott community up to in Idaho. I believe there's been occurrences in other states as well. But, uh, you know, they kind of uh, specialized in wildfire. All right, let's move to the current time. You're facing a new challenge now with the Arizona Public Service Personnel Retirement System. It's in trouble. The city owes millions. How does that affect your job? Well, my job is basically uh, ensuring the the public safety in regards to fire, emergency medical services, uh, technical rescue. Uh, you know, even though by brand uh, we are still titled a fire department, uh, that's a very uh, limited element of what we actually do. We're an actually an all-risk responder, and as such, uh, you know, we need certain tools in our toolkit to deliver all-risk services to our community, and that uh, is very personnel-intensive. Uh, and with that comes the burden of the unfunded liability, which uh, a lot of the local folks are familiar with, and even uh, statewide in Arizona they're very familiar with. But that is the legacy costs associated with the current uh, public safety personnel retirement system that uh, firefighters, police officers across the state are uh, required to be entered into upon their hiring. Do you detect some public resentment over the pension system? You know, I think it, it's across the board. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's folks that are think these are really lavish, uh, golden parachute-type uh, benefits that firefighters, uh, and for that matter, even up to fire chiefs, receive upon the conclusion of a 20- or 25-year uh, service commitment to a city or municipal government or a district. Uh, the reality is the, these are not uh, what I would say lavish pensions uh, in the grand big picture uh, sort of things. I'm sure there's many uh, financiers that are making much more money than what the line firefighter is. Uh, a typical firefighter after about uh, 25 years, his take-home pension is roughly about, uh, it's 50% of whatever his top three earnings were in the current tier system, and that usually equates to about 40000 a year at the maximum. Uh, so it's, it's not a really lavish thing, but there is probably a spectrum of the community that thinks that's uh, something that they didn't get, therefore uh, others shouldn't have an entitlement to. Uh, you know, there's talk uh, even in the military ranks uh, of changing their pension system. And, you know, there's a there's a risk that comes with the job, uh, law enforcement, police, fire uh, and armed services that uh, uh, really kind of require some sort of uh, defined benefit on the back end. Now, there's other ways to slice and dice that through uh, defined contribution pla uh, plans. But uh, there has been some. Uh, uh, pension reform has taken hold that I think will make it uh, much more sustainable as we move forward. I know it's been tough filling empty positions at Prescott Fire when the city has no money. How have you dealt with that? Scott, as you're aware, uh, you know, one of the challenges was not only the openings that we were occurring, we were, uh, when you do a market survey of uh, pay and allowances, we were under well under uh, the market norms uh, across the state of Arizona. And what they do is they basically assess those against like cities and like services. Uh, so, you know, we had a, a really kind of a hemorrhaging of our personnel 
that kind of took hold in the latter part of uh, uh, 2015 and the early part of 2016. And much of that was uh, based upon the need for something to be done in the compensation piece. Well, in order to make the compensation piece happen, you have to have the funding and availability to at least shore that up. And and with that, we came into some fiscal challenges. And uh, uh, it, initially, uh, January 1st of uh, 2016, we froze three positions, uh, which uh, necessitated a service uh, model change in the way that we did business and, and really ended up parking a fire truck in one of our fire stations and limiting that to an emergency response or a, an alternative response uh, vehicle that included just a paramedic and EMT to at least address an emergency medical services needs within that run area. So uh, there's been some complexities associated with that, and it's an ongoing battle. Uh, I'm thankful to say that, uh, you know, courtesy of uh, uh, a safer grant, we're able to restore our staffing, and that'll take effect come April 1st that we'll be back up with five fire engines uh, along with a command officer on duty 24-7, 365. Right, and as regards that station, the term was browning out when you held back the engine and just used the two-man rescue. You have a division chief who has said many times in the media, when there's a fire, only a fire engine will do. So has this resulted in some risk to the public? Uh, You know, it's very difficult for a fire chief or or any uh, person that's involved in an operation to try to qualify a negative outcome that this impacted this directly, therefore that happened. Uh, All said, though, I can tell you that there is uh, more than anecdotal information that uh, we had some very close calls, uh, particularly out at the airport. We had a very significant uh, dumpster fire uh, for which a fire engine was not available in the area. Uh, One was dispatched, but it came from really about two stations away since the one in between was uh, already on a call for service. But uh, through some quick uh, thinking and, and some uh, uh, good assessment, uh, our aircraft rescue firefighter uh, that's dedicated to the airport uh, took it upon himself, kind of weighed the flight activity, and made his uh, call to go ahead and respond across the airport and extinguish that dumpster fire. Uh, the other case in point was, well, there was a couple of them, but... Uh, couple I'll share with you here. One was a helicopter uh, that went down on the airfield, and normally uh, if the engine staff, that would have ensured a complement of at least four people on the initial response element from the airport fire station responding. In this particular instance, the the rescue truck was out of the area, still in its district, but had a little longer response time, so it had a single person on an aircraft rescue fire truck respond until such time the rescue showed up with two people and then the balance of an assignment. So it did have some delay. Uh, the positive out of that, and again, you can't prove negative outcomes, but, uh, you know, it was a, uh, yes, it wasn't a helicopter crash, but the injured were uh, minimally injured, and it didn't require any sort of extrication or disentanglement or anything of the patient. So uh, those two items uh, kind of jump out. And then there was one additional one uh, in which... Uh, Thank goodness that there was a law enforcement official in the area. There was a cardiac arrest in the area of the housing. And, uh, you know, for cardiac arrest, it's not just uh, two people in an ambulance that can handle it. It really takes about five sets of hands to handle a full code, as we call it in the business. And as such, uh, you know, good on, good on the police officer for uh, being able to help out the rescue crew and at least put three sets of hands until such time the ambulance arrived. So I think uh, those three items, uh, even though they seem like anecdotal information, uh, those kind of say, how, wow, we've kind of escaped the the, the, the shot kind of went by our ear and didn't really strike us, but it very well could have. Now that things are getting back to where you'd like to see them, how do you assess overall morale with your folks now? Well, as I alluded to earlier, morale is really hard to measure. I think... Uh, there have been an uptick, uh, and, and it first happened uh, last uh, July, and courtesy of the mayor and council, uh, you know, they burned some political capital to make the uh, compensation piece right and be allow our folks to become at least within market uh, 
within the local market be uh, compensated for their their really assessed value. Uh, so I think uh, you know we can always say, well, money doesn't drive morale, but there is a factor that money drives morale. So I think we saw an uptick in July. Uh, it does get very uh, disheartening uh, when folks uh, lay too much credence to reading blogs and see negativism about their fire service in this community. Uh, the reality is the men and women uh, not only would give their lives, uh, you know, they most, even though they have to have a real way to live and live comfortably, some of these folks uh, dedicate many, many hours than I ever uh, have to pay them for. They, you know, they're in the community, they're a fabric of the community. So that part, I think, uh you can usually kind of gauge morale by what's the willingness to do above and beyond. And I can tell you right now, uh, these men and women with the Prescott Fire Department go above and beyond day in, day out. And what are you looking forward to for the future of the Prescott Fire Department? Well, a couple of things that, uh, you know, I came into this position, uh, oh, it'll be three years of summer. And, uh, you know, I, there's a lot that uh, I really hope to get to, but I really haven't got to yet. Uh, one is I'd like to seek out uh, national accreditation uh, through the Center for Public Safety Excellence uh, as uh, administered by the Commission on Fire Accreditation International. I think that uh, lends itself to uh, setting the caliber of the department that we have here. And really, it's a t story to uh, subject yourself to a third-party review that, in fact, we do what we say we do, and we do it to national best practices. So that's still on my uh, horizon to accomplish. The other piece is, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be nice if we can get to a point where it's not just going from uh, figuratively one fire to another to another in the financial arena. Uh, you know, even though... Uh, uh, the citizens here locally will have uh, some control over that uh, opportunity, whether they vote for or against uh, a sales tax. Uh, that's entirely up to the individual and their preferences. But I think uh, if we could hit a platform of uh, uh, the burden that the PSPRS places on the general fund to be lessened, I think that would allow us to hit some of these uh, uh, benchmarks that we need to do to become the best uh, in our region, if not the best in the state. What time frame are we looking at for some of these things like accreditation? Are we talking well, months? The accreditation, years? you know, I put in place some of the requisite skill sets for uh, my leadership team to move that forward. It, it really becomes a, well, roughly about a 24 month. Uh, heads down effort to become an accredited agency. Uh, what it does for the community, first off, it, it really not only allows the fire chief to say that we're doing a good job, but when you subject yourself to a peer review, uh, it adds that extra measure of accountability to the organization. Uh, locally, we've had a couple of studies done, uh, specifically the ICMA study that was uh, commissioned in uh, the latter part of 2013 and was uh, the findings were revealed in uh, August, I believe, of 14, just shortly after I arrived. And the International City Managers Association said we're doing what we need to do to provide a service to our community. Uh, but that's uh, sometimes impacted by the fiscal constraints that get pressed upon us. All right, we'll leave it there. Chief Dennis Light, thanks for being on our first Code 3 podcast. Scott, look forward to listening to it. Have a great day. And that's all for this edition. Thank you for being here for our first episode. I'll be back next week with more interviews. I'm Scott Orr, and this has been Code 3, the podcast for firefighters. Code 3 is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To get in contact with us, visit Code3Podcast.com. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you should. Don't miss an episode. Find us at the Apple iTunes Store, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>